opportunity in the first video to kind of review some of the labs that we did last semester and review the lab that we did today in class on our first day. So we actually started our discussion of forces with a lab that was pretty straightforward and actually not that interesting. I gave you a spring scale and what you did was you put some masses on this spring scale and what you would do here is you would look at this mass and you'd notice that you had a mass in grams and you would convert that to kilograms and of course the way you would do that is you would take your grams and divide it by 1000 and then you would get kilograms and I think uh, what we did was we ended up going um, from 0 0.2 kilograms all the way up to 1.0 kilograms and you were just putting these various masses at the bottom of the spring and then you were reading up here, you were reading uh, the spring scale. And that would give you the weight of the object. And of course, if we're going to draw a free body diagram with the situation of a mass hanging on a spring, what you would draw is you'd say, well, there is the force from the spring in this scale. And there's the weight of the mass due to the earth. And since it's just sitting there, what we conclude is that the force of the spring has to balance the weight of the mass. So when I read this spring scale weight, or the spring scale force, what I'm really reading is the weight of the object, which means the force that the earth exerts on the object. Because let's remember uh, that weight is the force on M due to Earth. And of course, what we actually had you do in lab last semester is that you actually do a plot of the weight of the mass due to the Earth versus simply the mass itself. And um, you got a graph that looked like this. You'd go from 0 0.2 all the way to 1 kilogram. And you actually ended up going up to 10 newtons on the scale here. And so um, it was actually a pretty nice and straightforward uh, correlation. You'd get 2 newtons of weight force for every 0 0.2 kilogram of the mass. And um, when you did this, what, what people concluded is they said, you know, I can get the weight by taking the mass in kilograms and timesing it by 10. And what a lot of people were able to do is they said, wait a minute, weight is something that connects to gravity. And they asked themselves a deeper question, and this is really the conclusion that we were going for. And I didn't tell you this in class, almost everybody deduced this, what they said is, hey, wait a second, what causes weight is the gravitational pull of Earth. So when we say, weight is the force on M due to Earth, what we really mean is due to Earth's gravity. And if that's the case, maybe this 10 that we were measuring here is in fact exactly the 9.8 meters per second squared from kinematics. And so we actually came up with our first equation of the semester that we're going to be using today. So the whole point of the weight versus mass lab was to come up with the relationship weight equals the mass of the object times the gravitational pull of the planet that it's on. So that's kind of the first big formula that we're going to be using. Okay. So that's really like our first, that's our first, um, that's our first formula of the school year, um, of the semester. We actually used this last semester, but I told you weren't responsible for it on the exams. So now we're going to be using it this time. So the whole point of the weight versus mass spring scale lab was to actually come up on our own with the relationship that weight is the mass times the gravitational pull of Earth. Then we did a little bit of work with the marble and the dry ice. And if you remember, we had a marble spinning around in a circle. And what we noticed is if we have a marble spinning around in a circle like this, um, you know, and we had the cup over the marble, so we had a setup like this. We had a table and we had a cup. And we had a marble inside the cup, and we'd kind of spin the cup around and around. And the instant we let the cup go, the marble would shoot off at this tangent velocity. And what we concluded was, um, in the absence 
of a force. Something moving in a circle will stop going in a circle and instead moves in a straight line at constant speed. So that was one little conclusion that we got. So this is one little piece of the puzzle. That was from the marble. Then what we did is we played, so that was the first part of our little lab. And then the second part of our lab, we actually uh, played air hockey with um, an eraser, paper, and the fun one was dry ice. I'll put a little smiley face by dry ice because it was fun. And of course, the reason it was fun is dry ice doesn't slow down. And what we realized is that, in fact, it's not, when we push something across a table, this is, this is sort of what we thought. We thought if we push something, it naturally stops. That's what we thought. And this is wrong. That was what we came up with from the lab. What we concluded from our lab was, in fact, if we push something, if we push something, when we are done pushing, it stays in a straight line at constant speed. And then we realized a second part to this. If it slows down, something else is pushing it. If it slows down, something else is pushing it. And that's the idea. So what we did is we took the idea from part one and part two, and we formulated a completely new idea. And that new idea was Newton's, whoops, was Newton's first law, which will actually state, um, if I can, hopefully I can expand this thing. Let's see. Um, um, so that's not going to work. So let me just see if uh, we, oh, so yes. So here's what we got. We got Newton's first law, and this is what we deduced from parts one and two here. This, this one, this one here, and this one here. We were actually able to deduce Newton's first law, and this is what Newton's first law says. What it says is that if something is at rest, it will stay at rest. If something is moving, it will stay moving in a straight line and at a constant speed. If you manage, if, okay, if an object slows down, speeds up, or changes direction, that can only happen if an outside force makes it happen. And here are some results, here are some consequences of Newton's first law. First, um, if something is n not moving in a straight line, a force has to make that happen. Two. If something slows down, that doesn't happen naturally. Rather, some force must make that happen. 
And finally, um, if something is is to get something moving, moving, I need a force. And to slow it down, I need a force. Once I get it moving in the absence of friction, I am no longer applying a force and it continues in a straight line at a constant speed. The instant I stop touching it, I am no longer applying a force to it. So these are all things that I've written down here, and you actually have to le learn, like, know these things. So you want to make sure that if you're puzzled still, you watch the videos again, and if it's still kind of confusing you, you want to come see me after school with specific questions about specific concepts in the videos that don't make sense. All right, so we are, in this video, what I want to do is just kind of sum up what we did with the Friction Lab uh, today. And really what we did is we came up with two equations um, to describe friction. And if you remember in our lab, we had um, some masses and we had spring scales. And uh, what we do is we just pile objects on top of the mass. And uh, we did a plot of the um, spring force uh, that we apply the spring scale force um, versus uh, the the normal force um, of the table on the mass. So we had this free body diagram that looked like this. We had a um, a normal force and we had the the spring force, and then of course we had the kinetic friction force, um, and we had the weight of the object. And of course we know that normal force in this particular case happens to equal the weight. Um, and <clears throat> we got pretty much a linear plot, and what we were able to do is um, we actually called this slope, um, we called it mu kinetic for the moving object, and we basically came up with the equation that friction equals mu kinetic times the normal force on the mass due to the surface. Um, so um, what we were, because what we were able to conclude was that the spring force um, is actually equal to the kinetic friction. So what we finally wound up with was this law, kinetic friction equals mu kinetic times the normal force on the object. So that was really the point of today's lab. Yeah. And um, we actually did this identical idea for uh, the static case and we came up with the second equation, which is that static friction equals mu static times the normal um, normal force on the object. So we have these two equations here. And just to kind of wrap up, we've got weight on the mass due to Earth equals m times g, right? So that's one force. And um, finally, the last force that we came up with, uh, the last equation that came up with force is actually sort of a general equation, which is Newton's second law, which basically says that the sum of the forces acting on an object is equal to the mass of the object times its acceleration. So um, this is sort of where we're at. So this was first semester. This is Monday slash Tuesday. And this is Thursday slash Friday. So that's where we're at with the equations. And this is a really good place for us to be. And what I want to do in the next part of this video is actually talk about how to take uh, these friction equations and solve some problems. So you're going to do a few of those.